So we're here to talk about the institutional adoption outlook for 2024. Uh, in case you guys don't know me, uh, I'm Morgan Krupetsky. Uh, I lead uh, business development for institutions and capital markets at Ava Labs. Um, the Ava Labs is a software company building infrastructure tooling and partnerships to really drive forward the growth and adoption of the Avalanche blockchain. Uh, our featured guest today is uh, Ava Labs president, John Wu. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so maybe let's get in. I get into it. I think um, you know you've been in the digital asset space for a number of years now, uh, and given your background, you have a very unique perspective. I think in terms of not just the worlds of traditional finance, but also Web three, um, as well as how institutional perspectives and initiatives have evolved over time. So before we get into kind of the outlook and thoughts on 2024, let's take a moment to kind of take stock and think about 2023. We'd love to kind of get a sense from you in terms of what surprised you. Um, what have been some of the highlights, especially in the context of previous cycles that you've been through? Um, and maybe it would be helpful to kind of start with just like a high level overview of your background just so to like level set in terms of that context. Great, well, thank you for having me again. Um, so I'm John Wu, president of Ava Labs, as Morgan said, um, we are a software services company on top of the Avalanche blockchain that the original uh, Avalanche people are responsible for. The, so one of the questions in there was, how have I seen the evolution of institutional adoption? So my background, I came from traditional finance. I was a tech investor at Tiger, Kingdon, ran my own fund, and then I became an operator in this space in about 2017 or 18. And the reason why I did that was because I saw the block, that back then there was this thing called the ICO. And I looked at it like, wow, this is something that can actually change the way financial services operates, how you know, companies raise money, uh, both on the private side as well as potentially do an IPO. And more importantly for me, I thought it was the ability to tokenize assets to give access to the very much growing accredited and qualified investor in small family office. And um, that ultimately turned into um, different, for me, that mission continued at Ava Labs. Um, and one of the key things that we do in Ava Labs, and this is why we have Morgan, who is also a former TRAFI person, our, one of our key core um, uh, philosophical beliefs we have is that we need to tokenize the world's assets to create more liquidity, better access, and also give efficiencies in very old tech to Wall Street or financial services. So it means a lot. And the evolution of that path has really, really, um, I would say, accelerated throughout the various cycles. In 17 and 18, traditional Wall Street people um, completely dismissed it and thought about it as just a um, gambling mechanism, fun, but no real use case, to today where Morgan is super busy and constantly talking to some of the biggest names on Wall Street, so to speak, and working with them and building things that will be, that have been announced and will be announced very shortly. So I guess on that point to what you were saying, the concept of tokenization isn't new. Um, obviously, you were, you've been focused on tokenization even before you got to Ava Labs. Um, would really love to kind of hear your take on why or if this time is different from previous cycles. What do you think has changed, has not changed, or what might still be missing? What are some of the challenges from a tokenization perspective? Through a lot of iteration, finally, um, there are things that I would consider, and especially in the B2B space of um, people using the blockchain technology where there's actually product market fit. Stable coins, for instance, um, according to Brevin Howard's research report in 2022, there were as many dollars of stable coins settled on chain as there is in the whole Visa network, about 11 trillion. So if you look at our pipeline of partnerships that we are working with, there's a ton of um, companies that want to work with us in, in order to create their own version of stablecoin. So that is a big and growing market. So what we've seen is willingness to explore the space as a technology. And I think what we have right now is the first true product market fit for this space, uh, which is stablecoins. And I think also since, um, since your role at SharesPost in terms of what 
kind of existed then versus now, um, there's definitely a lot more, I would say, like infrastructure in place. Um, obviously, it's not 100% seamless end to end, but there's definitely more infrastructure put in place. You have executives at major buy and sell side firms touting the future is tokenization, which kind of implies that there's greater buy-in at the top. Uh, big players actually doing stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> in the space, um, which is exciting. And then I think it's also interesting, and this kind of leads into my next question in terms of um, as you've had rates in the real world going up and the value prop for pure mm -hmm. on-chain DeFi going down, I think we saw a greater sense of, sense of urgency to bring real yield or real world assets on chain. Uh, and you know, you mentioned obviously stable coins, but particularly yield bearing stable coins. Um, I think this year in particular, we've seen a lot of institutions, both startups and major buy and sell side firms focusing on on chain cash or payments mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form, um, which really I think ramped up this year. So whether that's stable coins, tokenized deposits, CBDCs, and other kind of cash equivalents like money market funds, you know, everyone and their mom is tokenizing these things. Um, so I'd, I'd be curious to kind of hear from your perspective, what trends do you think that we'll see in that space in particular over the next year? Well, as you mentioned, it's, it's also yield bearing stable coins. Stable coins kind of has a wider definition, which also is a problem because we need to narrow that definition for people to really create standards and, and grow. But uh, money market uh, funds that are tokenized We've seen that already come to fruition in two different places. First, uh, Franklin Templeton, they created this, uh, call it Benji app, where they've tokenized a money market fund. And interestingly, because it was tokenized in such an easy to use interface, that particular money market fund actually within the first month doubled their assets because everyone was using it because it was so easy to use and there was an interest in getting more yield uh, at the same time. Uh, JP Morgan working with BlackRock, they've also tokenized a money market fund. So that's a perfect example of like adoption, product market fit, and unfortunately for, it goes below the fold in terms of the search engine headlines because everyone's so focused on just hardcore crypto stuff. Whereas the, uh, call it, big boys are actually adopting the blockchain technology below the fold and quietly, but in big size. Yeah, I mean, I think to that point, uh, the common kind of go-to-market that we've seen among more crypto-native companies has been the idea of pitching to DAOs and uh, foundations, the idea of diversifying non-yield-bearing stablecoin exposure into yield-bearing cash equivalents. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, what I think is also particularly interesting is the idea of considering these tokenized money market funds um, in the context of institutional utility, mm -hmm. right? And so to your point with respect to what JP Morgan's doing, really instilling utility in, um, you know, in tokenized money market funds to facilitate intraday repo, for example, yeah. or to um, you know, use tokenized money market funds as collateral uh, for, for traditional yeah. trades. Um, so, for us, I think we get really excited when, when we find um, businesses and companies that are tokenizing things, not for the sake of tokenizing, but more how do they address real either pain points or um, real business, business cases. Yeah, um, there's, there's re so the, they call it Wall Street type uh, traffic or Web2, they look for business case first before they just start developing. And like you said, there are real business use cases now. In terms of tokenizing repo, another good example of a real business case, a public company called Broadridge, 16 billion in market cap, I think. They have created a tokenized uh, repo uh, settlement facility for uh, UBS and um, SockGen and a few other foreign players. They're doing over $1.45 trillion a month um, and they are saving those institutions millions and millions of dollars a year. Um, it is actually happening. I can't wait to be able to talk about the stuff that you've been instrumental at that's related to this that will be announced in what, two weeks in Singapore FinTech. And um, I promise you everyone in this room is gonna be calling her and wanting to know more about it and how to, if you're from an institutional uh, firm right now, you're gonna wanna participate in this. This is not financial advice. <laughs> 
So maybe let's switch gears a little bit and just um, and and talk a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is still, you know, one of the most kind of uh, quintessential macro barometers of the space writ large. Um, BlackRock, Valkyrie, Fidelity, yep. Franklin Templeton, was, uh, so many of them have um, have applied for spot Bitcoin ETFs. Yep. So to that extent. What developments do you expect um, for Bitcoin um, in, in 2024? So I hate to talk about price of any asset because we're in the business of building. But um, I think I'm very, if I were forced to talk about Bitcoin, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. And it may even happen sooner than 2024. Um, we know there's like almost between half a dozen to a dozen large institutions, all probably, who can tell with the SEC, but probably going to get an ETF uh, for the Bitcoin. And if you just take the, the one that's leading the way, $9 trillion of assets under management at BlackRock. And if Larry Fink makes that happen, just do whatever percentage you want of that user base using Bitcoin. And don't forget, um, Bitcoin market cap, it's only like four or 500 billion. So that's incremental additional supply into or demand into the Bitcoin ecosystem, if you will. Um, what I'm actually even more uh, excited about is that not obviously there's a business reason for Larry, I think, to want the Bitcoin ETF. He probably sees demand from his user base, and that's why he's done it about face. But he's talked about using crypto technology or blockchain technology as a way to improve businesses. So that's actually something that I'm even more excited about for our perspective, from our perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, obviously during the bull market, more and more companies uh, were in turn getting client demand for supporting crypto and crypto services as an asset class in and of itself. And I think despite the crypto bear market, I don't, I still don't think even in speaking with institutions that they've put a total stop to those efforts. I mean, sure, they've slowed down, but especially with these Bitcoin filings, I think there's an underpinning view that crypto as an asset class will come back. And obviously it's to your- It's you know, not the asset class. I mean, institutions, not just traditional financial, FinTech, you know, Web2 type players, they, they've gotten the joke. The, the technology can help them. Um, PayPal, PayPal's unfortunately um, is now got subpoenaed from the SEC yesterday for their stablecoin efforts with Paxos. Um, but there's a real reason why PayPal, Visa, MasterCard are all experimenting with this. I mean, you know, we've talked to PayPal many times. We may or may not be part of helping them do this effort with Paxos. But if, um, I don't know if you guys know, but PayPal owns, the corporation owns both PayPal Wallet and, and Venmo as well. And if Morgan wanted to move money from her Venmo account into her PayPal wallet, the existing, and they, you know, PayPal, the corporation, bought Venmo, just to be clear. They didn't develop it completely in-house. The tech stack is so different, and the, um, the rails are so different that literally if she's moving $100 from her Venmo to her own PayPal account, all within the walls of PayPal, the corporation, PayPal, the corporation, actually spends money to affect that change. So she sees $100 move, but it costs PayPal some sort of sense. So PayPal actually subsidizes that move for her. And this is why they're doing a stable coin, so that they can have a, a ledger that is far more advanced, and you don't have to go outside to a bank in order to make that transaction happen. So, I mean, they, they want to make the user experience good, so they don't, to, to the individual, they have no idea. But reality is it costs them a few pennies every time Morgan moves $100 from her Venmo to PayPal. Yeah, and I think... On, That's like you giving money to your child and then you have to pay someone, you know, a few cents every single time they go out to eat a burger or something. Well, to that end, I think you, um, you highlighted an interesting point in that more and more enterprises and financial services institutions, fintechs, are increasing look, look, looking at the technology to either address pain points or drive forward businesses and make for a better user experience for their customers, whether it's retail individuals or, or institutions. And 
to your point, upgrading legacy financial services infrastructure is not easy. <laughs> it takes a while. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, you alluded to the fact that it's encouraging to see institutions are continuing to power ahead with their initiatives despite uh, the developments over the past year and a half from a macro industry perspective. That is true. I mean, I think there are things that Web 2 can learn from Web 3, and there are definitely things from Web 3 that can learn from Web 2. Web 3 technologies are very good at functionality. They're not very good at UI, UX. They can learn from their Web 2 counterparts on how to make things more efficient. Um, every DAP that's had a huge success on Avalanche, it's because the UI, UX, was so easy as opposed to the underlying thing was so great. Um, back to the uh, Benji wallet from Franklin Templeton for Money Market. Part of the reason why they had that huge spike it was just so easy for someone to go in there, an existing client, to actually just go and buy or sell Money Market funds. Um, pivoting a little bit from institutional to more enterprise, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit on the enterprise front? Um, I know there's, um, a cohort of use cases around like loyalty rewards points that we've seen um, not only in the US but also globally throughout Asia. As you look to 2024, can you talk a little bit about kind of that realm, what, what you think will happen or what you're excited about as it relates to enterprise? So I'm super excited about two things related to this question. One, all the effort we have in Asia right now, um, it's important to note that since all these issues have popped up in the US and the regulatory uh, scrutiny has begun. Asia and Europe have actually started creating frameworks and, and become more friendly. So a lot of development and jobs, frankly, have gone offshore. And our uh, development, business development um, pipeline with Asian companies have literally gone through the roof, so to speak. We have some great, um, Things that we're doing with, for instance, that I can talk about, SK. SK is one of the largest conglomerates. They split into SK Telecom and a different part of the business, the, the, the business application side. And with SK, the business side, we um, have this uh, partnership with them where they're building on Avalanche a what we call a subnet. Think of it as an app chain. Their own blockchain powered by Avalanche, kind of like Intel inside. Um, they, share, they use the security of Avalanche and the benefits of the infrastructure of Avalanche so they can just worry about the app level on. Speed to market is a benefit for them to do this, but there's also a reason they, they're doing this. In their loyalty reward system in Korea, um, it's shared pool, unlike here where Marriott owns your uh, points, Starbucks owns your points. They, they don't talk to each other unless there's a bilateral agreement between the two companies. You can't go drink a thousand cups of coffee and go have one room at Marriott, um, or have one room at Marriott and then go drink a thousand cups of coffee. So in Korea, 24 million of the population, or about 40% of their population, and 100,000 unique merchants are in the same loyalty pool. When you have that much information sharing from so many different parties, and you need effectively money, these tokens to move back, or these uh, points to move back and forth in a seamless, fast fashion, you can use the blockchain to facilitate that. That's why they're doing this. But what's even more exciting about this is they're creating their own business use cases using this, call it, you know, app chain from Avalanche. There's actually two applications other than this, three applications total on this one blockchain that Ava Labs, Ava Lanch helped them spin up. They, the, the, just like most people in the States, if you're clipping coupons or using some of these points, it's probably an older user base. So SK is worried that their user base is getting too old. So what they've done is they created um, what is known as a um, Korean boy band. Uh, what are they called again? Um, uh, KT <laughs> so something, they, there's ATS, one of the Sorry, most popular <laughs> Korean boy bands, now has an app in the same SK um, <laughs> app chain so that they can create NFTs and on event or on concert type of uh, gamesmanship for the users. And um, they've also created an esports application on the same blockchain and did it very quickly. So what they're doing is they realize 
people who go to uh, KTS events and people who play esports games still like to have discounts at their equivalent of Gap or something or points to buy things. So there is actually increased engagement because they were able to roll these products out very quickly because of the ease of use of a blockchain and, and the, the fungibility of these points. So they've actually started to already lower the average age of the people in the original application for loyalty. So these are business use cases that are not obvious. So what I am very excited about is the activity that's happening we're seeing in Asia. There's similar ones that we're seeing in, in Korea, besides Korea, Japan, and other areas. And the fact that they are creating real product market fit and use cases on the blockchain, just like the traditional finance companies are here in the States. Yeah, and I think on, on that point, it, what's really interesting is we've seen a shift, I think, from back during the bull market when a lot of these uh, enterprise Web3 initiatives were largely driven out of marketing teams. And they looked at it as a way of like, how do we issue NFTs as a way to just like say that we're in the space mm -hmm. at a high level. Yep. And whereas what you're describing is very much driven by business needs mm -hmm. and business use cases to drive real business outcomes. And I, there was one time that you kind of like alluded to the idea that by doing that, you know, you don't have to, as an enterprise, you don't have to pay to reacquire yep. a lot of the data. If you could maybe talk a little bit about that, I think that would sure. be Sure. We've, uh, and, you know, the other thing we've been talking about is new way, talking to, in terms of trying to create solutions for them, um, are new age advertising type companies, you know, call it social digital type companies, who um, also uh, recognizing that a lot of these, um, call it enterprises or Web2 type companies, they are constantly doing the old awareness engagement and then click through or customer acquisition, the traditional funnel. And they have to actually go back and repurchase uh, if they don't retain 100% constantly. That's just how you know, the existing thing works because people get separated from their data. They've got to reacquire me every time I do a new search or whatever. But there are some of these new age advertising, um, call it digital ad agencies, are tr also experimenting on blockchain because then they have the data and they don't need to like have the call. It. In every agency, there's creative and there's also a um, buy side or they go buy advertising for you, either SEM or Facebook feeds or something like that. So if it's all in a transparent blockchain, they can go require it themselves instead of having all that data stuck at Google. So you have to pay Google for that data and reacquire it constantly. So the enterprises win because they spend less. The ad agencies are innovating their business. Um, and there's so much money at Google and, and, and Facebook right now, they're not really feeling that much pain yet because it's still a small space. But this is another example of a real business use case that is starting to develop. Pivoting a little bit to DeFi and comparing it kind of to the world of TradFi, um, how do you see these worlds kind of evolving over the next 12 months? Do um, you think that they'll move closer together, that they'll kind of continue to grow as or, or operate as parallel systems? Um, what is your view kind of on that? Uh, In the that next economy? 12 months, they will still be very much parallel systems. There's two different user bases for both of them. Um, but they will learn from each other. And if the uh, time frame was set, or the duration was set to 12 years, I think they will converge. But still, even in the long run, I still feel like there are two different systems. There is a system, it's a white glove system and a do-it-yourself system. That exists in Web2 right now. Certain people want to be able to call up someone and scream at them and, and figure, you know, and, and have everything handheld for them. And they feel like there's a comfort with someone telling them something. Others, generally younger, they like to do it themselves and they're very web and tech savvy. So DeFi will always exist for a certain side of the customer and, and call it the TradFi style of doing things will always exist for institutions or, or uh, white glove service. But they will converge, they'll learn each other, products will look more similar. It's not in the next 12 months. This is an evolutionary type process. We'll have to come back next year and like, ask you the same question every sure. year to keep It'll going. It'll be 11 years. Yeah, 11 years later. Yeah. Um, and I think to that, to that point in terms of TradFi, what we've actually seen, which is really interesting, I think, is the idea of 
traditional financial services institutions, not necessarily um, embracing institutional DeFi, but embracing the concept of, I think, what we've termed on-chain finance or on-fi, which is really the idea of um, you know, institutions using blockchain rails, using smart contract logic, using decentralized applications, yep. but to power traditional trading or trading of traditional mm -hmm. assets in a way that effectively um, you know, upgrades legacy infrastructure yep. and institutional workflows. And I think more and more institutions are starting to I, I mean, I, I'd like to think that they're embracing the term on-fi because I think institutional DeFi kind of scare them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it's, it's great to see that um, they, they understand or they're starting to wrap their brains around like the, the potential benefits of uh, you know, th this upgrade in terms of- Well, they're only seeing the benefits because the efforts of people like yourself and the firms like Ava Labs. In Singapore, they have great sandboxes. So you know, traditional, uh, finance companies or banks or asset managers don't feel like they can accidentally get in trouble. Mm. In um, Europe, in certain areas, there's also sandboxes that they can experiment with. In the US, there really isn't that sandbox. So creatively, what all the labs and uh, Morgan Spearhead is, is creating this thing called Spruce Network. And partners in there, and some of them are here today, um, are T. Rowe, Wisdom Tree, Wellington, where they, and then they're gonna have the ability to have the traditional DeFi dApps in there. So they get to experiment in a, it's, it's a valueless token, and this blockchain network is only gated by KYC AML, the necessities, but they get a chance to see how this technology can happen. They get a chance to see how their developers can easily uh, take advantage of the composability of an open source technology and they get to do it in a compliant way and, and also in a way that they won't tr uh, trip any regulatory wires because it's valueless token, but they also get to see to our benefit the power of the avalanche technology. So this is all happening thanks to the efforts of people like Morgan as well as- I didn't ask him to say this, but this is great. Keep going, <laughs> what else? Well, no, that's the point. <laughs> the point is that things are moving on and they are learning about yeah. the benefits of DeFi from real use. Yeah. And I think um, I would be remiss not to mention the R word, regulation. Um, I know that you referenced a little bit to Singapore Sandbox, just like in general, as you look to 2024, um, what are your thoughts from like a regulatory perspective, whether in the US or globally? Well, listen, um, we're not um, policymakers and most, well, we, you and I are not. Um, you know, we have to comply and we believe in sensible regulation and um, we need to remove bad actors to the extent that that is happening, that's great, but it's a global thing. And I do wanna emphasize that the regulations are becoming clearer. In the EU, they have this framework called uh, Mika. In Singapore, they're creating sandboxes. In Hong Kong, they're allowing retail to trade. So um, I was just talking to the CMO of the Thai here and he was talking about bullish where it used to work. They've moved their exchange all to Asia and to Hong Kong. So I just want jobs and people to stay on shore and develop them to be here. What's kept this country at the top of everything is the innovative spirit and the capital markets to fund that spirit. And we're pushing both of those offshore right now. And it's not just Web3, AI. Um, Biden came out yesterday with his thing, uh, you know, executive uh, order, so to speak. If you read through that 160 pages, similar things could happen over there. Uh, and I guess as we wrap up, um, any last thoughts, predictions, views that we haven't covered yet? Um, for what time frame and when? For the next year. Just the, for next, the next year. year either with respect to the institutional or enterprise adoption so, trend? So um, it may not even be next year, maybe soon an ETF will be approved for Bitcoin spot ETF. Um, there are already um, you know, futures ETFs out there, not much volume. I think we'll have far more um, regulatory clarity, not regulation to this full extent by the end of next year. I also expect continued development, and that's evolutionary. That's not like a one-off thing. 
Um, but I also think, just like we're talking about stable coins being the product market fit right now, there's going to be some big example, whether it's SK or something else that we're working with, that we can point to as, here is um, product market fit for this part of Web2. Great. And again, we'll have to come back next year and <laughs> do this again and take stock of the predictions from this year. But thank you again for, uh, for joining us, John. Thank you guys for, for joining as well.